So I'm, I'm Brian Parkson, CEO at Gen Factory, um, and let me, as always, start with acknowledging the fact that we're here on Gala and we pay respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, and also uh, thank our, our great partner, the University of South Australia, uh, for, for allowing us not just to spend here, but for all the other great things we do together. Um, special treat for me personally is, is um, Elliot Rich is not just uh, a superstar in Australian design right now, uh, a dear and, and, and a much loved friend. Um, and it's great having Elliot here uh, this week doing the um, cross workshop, uh, cross uh, discipline workshop rather, uh, for our associates uh, at the GM. Um, and uh, Elliot has had various things to do with Jam Factory over a bit of time, but um, back in 2013, her and her husband James were living in Adelaide for a little while, and I had the great pleasure of, of working very closely with Elliot while she was part of the work uh, as, we, as we collaborated on uh, curating the, the Wood Show, which set off that series of, of great projects. Um, so I'm happy to meet you as an audience. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Um, and I'll stop banging on now and give it up for Elliot Rich. Nice to have been, you know, had people along the journey with you. Um, so thank you for being there from the beginning, really. Um, and I've got to talk into this, don't I? Is that better? Ooh. That's big. Um, yes, to the Gardner people of this nation and all First Peoples of this continent, I genuinely give my respect and gratitude for your role as caretakers and custodians. And to the First Peoples of the planet, um, may the battle against your ways of being end soon in this and understanding. So I don't really actually, being in Alice Springs is fairly remote. I think I wish I kind of talk about it as the Noah's Ark of culture. There's usually, you know, one person from every discipline. Now there's lots of ceramicists. Um, but I, um, yeah, don't often have the opportunity to give talks like this. So thank you for your attention and um, for the time. Um, but it really, yeah, it, they are helpful in terms of understanding, marking where you're at at a particular moment in your, um, dare I say, career or practice or way of discovering your place in this crazy wild world that we have. Um, so, yeah, I hope soon to have some a moment to actually appreciate that and gain some perspective of it of, um, um, over that. Um, so I'm going to show you really a very broad sweep of my life and how I got to this point and this place right here and now. Um, uh, I do have a micro microphone, but if anybody's got any questions, the conversation is usually almost more exciting than a model, so please feel free to, um, yeah, engage. Um, so, I um, first heard the word design in year seven or eight art where we were given the role of designing a CD cover. Yeah, so you kind of get a sense of how long ago that was. And um, I really, there was something like a, you know, a duck to water. I just, I loved it. I had this collage language going on. I had a, you know, I developed my own font, had a series of three, um, and the art teacher, you know, kind of said, oh, you've really got a, a knack for design. And I think looking back and now having young children and seeing how they play, I always had this really um, a curiosity for how materials came together. So I used to have a, uh, still do, although it's trash now, thanks children, a micro machine collection. Um, micro machines with these, you know, beautifully made tiny, tiny cars. Um, and I used to mix the micro machines with particular marbles. So one micro machine to get two marbles, and I would, you know, kind of find this language between the marbles and the colour and the tone and the texture and the material that they were made of, we kind of mix and match them with the micro machines. And um, you know, so there was that, but also every birthday, whether for a friend or a family, I was constantly making things, none of which have lasted the test of time. They were lots of polystyrene and bits of fabric and feathers and wires and just yeah, way too much hot glue. Um, but 
yeah, there were there really when I can when I look back, I can really see that there was all you know I was really interested in the way that materials functioned and spoke in in, in relation to me and to other people, um, and saw the the I guess the value in especially in that gifting that you could kind of embed your energy and meaning and feeling for somebody in a gift. Um, so alongside that. Um, my parents all had, to less or greater or different ways, a kind of interest in social justice. So uh, one parent's a diplomat, the other's a pharmacist, and one was a public <coughs> servant but, but very strong um, and recent ties to the union. So I kind of grew up in a household, two households, where people were demonstrating just gaining kind of justice through different means. and. Um, we used to camp at the South African Embassy in Canberra, so I spent most of my childhood in Canberra, um, and we would camp there to protest against apartheid. And I remember that it was up kind of alongside a very busy road, and people would drive past and beat their horns in support of what we were doing. And just the sense of camaraderie that I felt from those beats, and that sense of kind of being together with people and forming a community, and I guess, yeah, kind of going through those baby steps of um, learning what it meant to organise and and stand up really for what for something that you or in that case my parents believed in. Um, so I kind of I you know always once I'd heard the word design I kind of knew that I was going to be or intend to pursue this idea of design. Um, I went to a college in Canberra, I took it as a subject, um, I then did it at. Um, at uni, and it really did feel like this perfect kind of confluence of, you know, in a world that's so obsessed with material culture and wealth, that it did feel like the perfect place to kind of agitate for change. So, um, this is my room at uni. Felt like the floor was the perfect place because look at that bench space, it's huge. Um, this was basically the state of my room most of the time. Um, lived in a fantastic warehouse with probably 40 other creative and you know, kind of wild experimental people, which had its downsides too. Um, but um, so here I am on the roof of the warehouse testing this bowl, which when you poured water into it, the water became a conduit. We turned on a light that would kind of, I think you can kind of see it here actually, um, turned on a light which would glow through a little red acrylic heart. So I was, you know, kind of in uni really interested in how um, the emotional potential that objects could have um, and, yeah, experimenting with that. So um, this slide is three projects from uni. It does feel like it well, is a, a long time ago, but I think it's... Yeah, anyway, interesting to see where I, what I was experimenting with then and how um, I'm continuing to experiment, and they're, they are related. So Molka, um, and I still, we still live with this object, so it's my bedside table, but every birthday we take it out, take all the passports out of it, and fill it with birthday presents. And so it, it was this idea of how you, how you give objects longevity, um, how objects can, in return, give you ritual and meaning. And so we have this object that holds, you know, this kind of practice that we have. Um, and Mulga was the name of my great grandmother. So it's this idea of how objects can, you know, communicate, hold, provide space for ritual, meaning, and connection. Um, biscuits. This was I studied jewelry in um, uni. So I went to Kofa. Kofa was this fantastic kind of very cross-disciplinary, taught you a process of design, taught you a conceptual development process, and um, from that you could focus on, um, I think it was up to six different, um, they had six different studio spaces in there, so jewellery was one of them. This gets, was this idea that, you know, when you put something on your body, you really indicate what you value. Um, in this case, you baked biscuits into your jewellery so that when you ran into somebody on the street, you could break it open and share it with them. And how, you know, that, that by demonstrating, by wearing this, providing this opportunity, I was, yeah, really saying that friendship and connection is, um, yeah, of value. And then on the right there is um, one shot of the lichen. Uh, this was my, my, my year fourth, like, major project. Um, and... 
It's a kind of two-part system. This is the canvas piece, depending on its fold, can be used as either a tarp, a jacket, or a swag. And really, I was looking at how um, the other part was infrastructure built into the awning sites um, in CBD Sydney. And I was looking at how infrastructure and object design can really, A, practically make space for that, but also legitimise it as a way of being. So I had done some long walks and lived, you know, a kind of pretty much nomadic life for a year. And it was, it has, comes with so much value and learning and um, opportunity to really engage with people and place in ways that we don't often get in a kind of, in a city environment. So, 2004, James and I moved to Alice Springs, um, and people often ask, why did you move to Alice Springs? And, you know, we were really young, so we, we, we were like, let's, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big decision. I remember we were sitting on a headland in Coldale where James was living, and it was like, I had to do a professional placement for my uni degree. Um, James, we've both done some work with Camels before, he wanted to pursue that. I arranged to do some work with the Centre for Appropriate Technology, who are a First Nations skills and technology-based organisation still, still going today. Um, and so Alice Springs was the only place where James could pursue his career as a Camelier, and I could kind of fulfil my desire to, um, yeah, use design as a kind of role for change and empowering other people. Um, you can see how old it is because it's printed on a photo. Um, so this is the beautiful, yeah, McDonald Ranges, really on the end there. Which all this whole range is just kind of embedded deeply with the stories of the um, Islander people there. Um, so yeah, quite a remark. We're standing on Anzac Hill, which cut the top off another very sacred site. It's an extremely complex um, but inspiring and engaged place to live. Um, so I worked at CAT for three years, 2004, and then in 2007 I started my own studio practice. Um, and yeah, actually, I heard this great story of, um, so when pigs are domesticated, they're all kind of pink and quite passive and kind of, not passive, but they're, they're, they're a particular kind of um, morphology. And if a pig gets out of captivity, they become a boar. So they grow tusks and their hair gets bigger, like thicker, and they kind of, you know, take on these other other traits. Um, and I feel like having been freelance in 2007, I can never go back into captivity. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so I think it's a good uh, analogy. So I'm just going to take you through these kind of three aspects of my practice. It's taken me a long time to actually work out, and I think enough work and perspective to understand that's kind of where I spend my time. You know, um, this is probably at this point in time the you know exploration is where I'm spending most of my energy and um, resources, service, and then product. So, um, product design is product. This is um, a, is a collaboration with my partner James B. Young. We come together as, so we both have our own separate studio practices that come together as Elbow Workshop. And really the idea with Elbow Workshop was to provide a space, that's what our studio space is called, physical space, but also a kind of um, creative space for us to collaborate. So James is a remarkable um, shoemaker and leather worker. He, as Brian mentioned, when we moved to Adelaide, he did the last year of the TAFE course here. Um, so sad that it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but since then he has really kind of, yeah, honed his material practice. Um, so these are more, uh, this is not his, his kind of James B. Young work, this is Elbow Workshop, it's much more production friendly um, and yeah, we really talk to a local market there, although trying to extend out from there. Um, so this is our Crescent range, our workshop is on Healy Crescent. Uh, we do a series of tea towels which are all kind of, um, you know, softly, uh, kind of softly activist in their way. So we've got a government that um, is hell-bent on fracking. Um, and so this was a way of talking about the Alice Springs water source and how kind of unique, unique and precious, precious it is. So Kwaja um, is our underworld for water. Um, you can't really see it here. I went to, so this is the total kind of capacity of the um, Marini Aquifer. This is when we started mining it in 1964, and we're about 20% of the way through. 
it only gets harder and more expensive um, to mine the further down you go. One cubic metre of water is about six bathtubs and we only pay $1.96 for it. Um, this is when you can see it made up of um, a few thousand dots and each dot represents a year. So the age of the water is between 10 and 30,000 years old. And then this is, uh, this is kind of this striking example of how much we take out and how much gets recharged. Um, and then this is, you can't see it here, but these are a stack of troopies. Um, so yeah, about 76 troopies down the, um, the aquifer starts. So yeah, um, we have fun in that space. It's very, we've learned a lot that R&D is expensive and to really try and pick and choose when you spend time developing new products and that experimentation is not part, uh, yeah, huge experimentation. I now do that in my exploration work and not necessarily in this product phase. So there's been a lot of um, learning that's gone on in that practice together. So here's a studio, beautiful. We get rock wallabies and kangaroos up on the hill. Certain times of year, there's all these Yabruni caterpillars that come up and we save, you know, have to pick them up frantically off the driveway and put them on, their, on the yepa yeah, grass, which they eat. Um, but yeah, lots of old machinery. Anyway, if you come to our Springs, come say hello. So this is the other part of my practice, the service-based practice, um, where really I am um, using my skills as a designer to bring other people's vision and needs into a material form. Um, lots of graphic design, these are just a few projects that I've worked on in the last few years. Um, the Indigimoji project, which is beautiful, lots of logos, which I love because they're so neat and contained. Um, lots of publications. I work quite a, a bit with uh, MPY Women's Council on the Woody Cullen Jumpy Project. This is now, you see this, pro this poster in every remote community and school and art centre. It is a, it's really a privilege to have been a part of it. Um, this particular work is looking at um, how to communicate cross languages and cross culturally um, in a mental health space. So this is now being turned into flashcards and um, Fridge magnets um, and really, you know, the, I was led and guided by the people who I was working with on that. So, um, yes, I had definitely had creative input, but it was really, um, yeah, truly being able to listen to what people needed and what they were after and being able to put that into something. Occasionally we get asked to make um, as a service, bigger things, not just flat and small things. So the Anolinum chair, which ended up going to uh, one of the architecture biennales in Venice. I don't remember which one? 18. 18. Um, so working with Centre for Appropriate Technology, I went to them many years ago and said, hey, you guys have got this great workshop, you're interested in skills development, let's just let's like start a brand, a design brand where you can actually export um, furniture and goods to the rest of Australia. Every, almost everything is imported to Alice Springs, so it was this inversion of things going out and we can embed story in this. So the Inerlinum chair was an attempt at that. Um, it did go on um, to become, yeah, there was another um, kind of project that came from it, um, which were the Wren chairs, which are now in Sydney, Darling Porter, that's what it's called. The beautiful little Wrens that, that Kat um, made and produced. Um, Kora Kora Ka, so this is by an artist called Trudy and Kamala, um, this beautiful new park which used to just be kind of this dust bowl, um, working with Trudy to bring her beautiful Kora Kora Ka, her owls into, um, yeah, a public art scale. Um, they, yeah, yeah, so there's two of them that sit next to each other and they're these kind of guardians and company, give, provide company in the park. And then Victoria Amazonica, was an incredible opportunity to um, collaborate with us, um, Umberto from Studio Campana and um, Yerondale Air Art Centre. And really, um, yeah, I felt like, you know, we were the, I was the, the nexus in, you know, hearing what Campana wanted to do and, you know, understanding the needs and kind of um, intentions and desires of the artists at Neil and out there working very closely with the art centre manager um, and workers there. So this was a dome at the NGV Triennial. Um, <laughs> Seven. Eighteen or something? Twenty? Okay. The first one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
yeah, <laughs> part way through this process, somebody realised that um, we couldn't actually, the original design, we couldn't fit in their door. That was a good thing to know before we made it all work. But this was actually one of the only works that was um, produced and made um, in Australia and definitely in remote Australia, so we feel pretty proud, proud of that. And occasionally I get to do works as my um, four clients outside of Central Australia and, um, and in, that, in the, these cases I get to, um, you know, expand my creative voice within that. So Stylecraft, Different Thoughts Collection, which came out of the AFTA Award, very grateful for that moment in time. Um, this is a facade that's just uh, the building's in, in construction at the moment. Um, so yeah, repeat pattern poured concrete motif on the, you know, this was the public art component of this development. And then the Reba cabinets for Design by Them, which was just launched, um, which are extremely tactile and just so satisfying to run your fingers through if you ever get the opportunity. So designers exploration. This was the, this was a turning point for me. I think um, place, this was the object that was, um, that won after that, that second year that it ran, second time that it ran. Um, and I think prior to this coming out of uni, I had this very, I was trained that you really had to, every decision you make, you had to justify. From the brief all the way through to the outcome, you had to piece it apart and be able to justify and stand behind every single step that you took. And in this one, in this work, I finally went, hang on a minute, there's this whole other avenue of intuition and expression that it doesn't have any part in that, that I can't actually explain and I can't, you know, put into a box and I can't write down, but it's, you know, it's something that I actually want to say through observation, um, through, you know, kind of material curiosity and... It was very liberating, actually, to just be like, you're allowed to be creative outside this rational kind of framework, conceptual development framework. Um, so place was, is it almost is a portrait of, of country as, you, as I was driving um, through the um, East McDonald Ranges. It's a beautiful drive. It describes the kind of three depths that you experience when you're traveling through, um, you know, in a car. This drawer at the front is the kind of, you know, close-up, detailed um, objects, bushes, trees, rocks. Then further away you have a kind of midfield, uh, midfield smaller ranges which you can still see the detail of. And then in the distance, the beautiful ranges um, and this incredible colour that is very hard to describe. Um, and I'm, you know, usually I'm in the car like this, trying to just actually see the colour, but it's 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 more than a colour. So um, yeah, I really feel like this this piece is you know um, is a bookend to what came before and after. The other thing that happened around that time was I saw a presentation of the Persephone story by a union psychologist Craig Sand Rock. Um, on the Ilpapa quarry. So quarry, they used to mine um, rock there. It's no longer active. They left it as a total mess. So there's still actually this beautiful stage there. And he delivered um, with lots of kind of people who had Greek heritage this story of Persephone. And so this is actually, you can look at the rock where the play was taking part or where you turned around and that's what you saw. And it was this very um, moment of truth where I realised... Um, that story could, story based, you know, the, the, um, the Persephone story links kind of history and politics, but it also holds hands with, um, with mythology and magic and land and connection. Um, and there's this beautiful kind of abstraction that goes on somewhere in the elbows there while, while you're holding hands with history and politics and land and place and then delivered through story. So this is when I went, hey, there's this incredible kind of uh, method of communicating, embodying all these different kind of knowledge and types and it's called mythology. Um, so that was, yeah, I remember that moment and feeling goosebumps and going, oh my goodness, this is a whole... Um, it, it fits. 
This was other places. Again, these are portraits of the landscape um, and really talk, trying to talk, my, anybody who's been the associates will um, feel this now, trying to talk to the sentience of the land. Um, you know, uh, Western thought den denies any kind of sentience or livingness of the country. Obviously, first it would not. Obviously, First Nations people are very good at not having that distinction. Um, and there are moments where I have felt that country was alive. I've seen it and known it, and um, they are liberating and exhilarating. This series was kind of trying to talk talk to that through objects, um, and then transformation. This is called the first appearance of Weaver. This is a hanging shelf made from um, <coughs> essentially the the fibre they used to make wigs. And to use it, you, in the same way that you might tuck anybody with long hair, might tuck, or somebody else's hair, you might tuck um, your hair behind your ear. That's how you kind of open the shelving, and then there's shelves inside it. Um, so this was my first kind of foray, and you know, um, I've learned to not necessarily have the story before the object, and sometimes the object allows the story to come. So this is called the first appearance of Weaver, and Weaver is a. Um, is an entity that now appears in a lot of my work and is a kind of core tenet of the mythology that I am um, offering. Uh, the other amazing thing that happened was I got a fellowship um, through Arts NT. They went all of a sudden, oh, we need to give our established artists a significant amount of money um, to, you know, d develop whatever they want to do. It got much tighter after the years. This was the first year and they were like, just have the money, do whatever you want, which was incredible. But basically I spent, I used that and spent a year reading. I read, I, you know, um, <laughs> didn't make a thing, but I read a lot. And I just realised that, you know, uni was this fantastic kind of four and a half years of exploring, you know, all this input and just, you know, you went in and you kind of funneled out into all these different interests and I hadn't had that opportunity and the fellowship really provided that moment where I could, I just wanted to understand what the design world was thinking, what were the, you know, what was the discourse. Um, and actually what I discovered was that, um, yeah, ecologists and artists are really have got very exciting things to say. Um, so lots of what I read, I, you know, there's children's books in there, there's, um, Books about language, birds, that, that book I've realised I've got twice. Um, by Deborah, is it Deborah Bird Rose? The Wild Country is incredible. Um, really did dug deep on, on mythology. These are just a few of the books, but it was it was really having that, it just, I'd like to say it broadened my horizons. It made multiple horizons visible. So this was... <laughs> oh. This was me trying to explain all that thinking then in um, a kind of diagrammatic way. Of, yeah, so I sent this to somebody and said, hey, can you, you know, I'm kind of thinking this, do you know anybody who might be a mentor in this realm? And actually, I probably asked about 20 people and everybody came back, no, um, because nobody, if you study in any kind of formal setting, you have to be extremely specific about what you did. And I was actually interested in the big history of the world and the planet and, the, you know, kind of contemporary politics that, um, that we feel and that flow from that. Um, but yes, interested in how mythology is both a, a, a nesting of knowledge, is both political and historical um, and, you know, observational. So while I'm doing this reading, I'm also producing work, um, trying to articulate through objects and also text what I'm thinking, trying to um, Make sense really of all the input that was that, that synthesized, what the input that was work that I was having, and um, yeah, finally, so transformation of Weaver, um, the Weaver character creates all the patterns that we know on the planet. She exists at a scale that we don't, um, we it's we can't relate to both microscopic and at a macro scale, but. Within our context, she makes herself visible as a bird. Um, so birds are the creature at our scale that does all the weaving of matter on our planet. And so this is a kind of way of um, diluting all the category categorization that we have for different objects, both living or unliving, and just saying everything is a pattern um, at multiple scales, and Weaver is the entity that creates that pattern. Um, Waratah. 
So following on from the Ursula Le Guin um, book, carrier theory, carrier bag theory of fiction, um, trying to think of the planet as a basket, a basket where all matter has always and will continue to reside, and the waratah as a symbol of that basket. And so the weaver works with all, within all the um, matter that, was in, that it sits and is held by the basket. Um, so this is almost a portrait of Earth in a, in a kind of basket form. In our, in our context, we see it as a waratah flower. And this is the, the publication that I put out at the same time, the essay um, that goes with that work. So it's, um, I am, I, I, I ask objects to do way too much and I am trying to find other ways of building the world because the objects themselves, without all the kind of cultural practice around it, um, they have to work very hard to actually a hold attention and communicate this very, you know, kind of multi-level philosophy or mythology that, I, that I'm trying to propose. Um, so, yeah, looking at other ways to build that world. Um, so I'm just going to read something here. Put it in the notes. So three projects that I did that all actually um, kind of, yeah, they not kind of, they are the same idea and um, relate to that idea of the Waratah. These works came from an exhibition called The World is Made of Relative. The matter that we are, that makes all that we know, has been collected together and tended to by deep time, caressed, shepherded, woven into forms known and otherwise. How do we give prominence to the beingness of matter to understand the ancient kinship of everything that makes birth? Can we invert our gaze so that we see Earth as one entity the same way we know the moon? Maybe gravity is an expression of that familial, omnipresent commitment. Can we be more attentive to our own velocity to know that all matter is in constant relationship to its neighbour? Shifting, transforming, warping, wefting, our edges blending and blurring, constant, imperceptible change. These bodies we think of as ours are just borrowed, a passing arrangement, maybe agreement, of molecules. Um, there is a strange dissolving feeling that accompanies the, this idea of mistiness. Through the everlasting weaving of matter and the unbearable fleeting livingness of this moment, the world is made of relative, known and otherwise. So this is an idea that I'm, yeah, trying to express through material forms. This mirror is about my height um, and remains a joyously wild, crazy work um, that I really did enjoy. Nobody's bought it. That's okay, because <laughs> I love it. So that there's uh, mirror pieces in there as well, so it does loosely have a function. Um, loosely. Yeah, well, it functions with a loose industrialised, an industrial recognised function. I'm intending it to have a much broader function than that. So as part of um, the mythology thinking, I, I really do want to say these things. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm trying not to get too deep into the theory, but Shadow metaphors are these value sets that we have embedded so deep into our cultural practices, language, value sets, that actually we can't really see them anymore. And so I do find it's um, important to actually describe what they are. So, so the work that I do pushes against this, but to know what you're trying to, you have to know what you're pushing against to then know what you're moving away from and towards something else. So nature is machine. When Europeans developed the clock, it seeded the idea that nature too was a mechanism made of parts. This belief has shaped the way we reduce the world to individual objects, denying the relational and collaborative practices that allow all matter to take form and exist. The hierarchy of beings was first proposed by the ancient Greek philosophers and then built on through Christianity. The belief that all forms of matter can be placed on a ladder that determines their worth, placing sky gods at the top and minerals or the land at the bottom. Um, actually, minerals were on there. The land as a as a whole thing didn't even make it onto the ladder. It's just complete becomes totally background to a human endeavor and human practices and stories. And then all all roads lead to Rome. 
Um, many cosmologies see time as circular and embrace non-linear and non-binary thinking, practicing holding many truths and realities at once, knowing that a path can take you many places depending on how you travel, travel it. This breaks from rational limitations and conventions. So um, I've been carrying these ideas around for probably three or four years and um, there's some kind of, there's some edges that I'm not sure of, but they keep coming, everything, you know, all the events that happen, I can kind of, I can tie back to these value sets. Um, and once you see them, you realise how embedded and how omnipresent they are in, in our lives. Um, and I think actually science teaches us that none of those are true. And compassion and care also teaches us that none of that is true. So, um, Yes, I continue to try to make sense of what the world that I'm attempting to build, this mythology. There's some interesting kind of, uh, this happens mostly in Alice Springs, mostly through the wonderful um, Ari that is Watch This Space. Uh, so this is, I call it Mything with Kin. Sounding Ground was an experimental weaving where we um, adapted headphones and had tubes that we buried in the ground and we sat for many hours one night and wove. Um, there was somebody who was the uh, who was the honey eater who came and attended to us and we rotated and we had this kind of ritual kind of movement to stretch and um, so we wove this thing together while listening to the ground um, and yeah kind of trying to develop a ritual practice around object making. Um, other scope was a very fortunate and um, full of gratitude for the opportunity to create a work for the Powerhouse Museum, working with um, Joel Pearson, who's a neuroscientist, and the Canberra Glass Works. So the idea was it's a, a, a tube, a glass tube, a slumped glass tube. Glass people know what that means. Um, and at the end is a carved mirror. So when you look into it, your face actually becomes that of an owl. Um, and there's actually owl sounds built into it. So it was this idea of trying to see yourself and blur that distinction between you and other. Um, and yeah, so here's my most recent work, which I actually can't articulate yet. <laughs> um, but I'm getting there. So the lithic, the liminal, and the lines that bind, which just launched at Melbourne Design Fair, very, very fun week. Fantastic time to be a designer, knowing that that world and market and audience are, are, are receptive. Um, so that was really so um, energising. Um, these are cast bronze pieces. That was the first cast ever done. Um, and yeah, really, it felt like alchemy to send off this weird moulded play with bits of rock and stick stuff on it and then come back with these amazing heavy bronze, you know, plants that had, yeah, just weight and gravitas to them. So that was a, yeah, little material thrill. Um, so I've made three tables, but I will continue to make, to build on this series so that, yeah, the intention is that no two tables are ever the same. And I, I would now, outside of the design fair, I'd like to try using kind of found, weird, less, um, less, uh, can, less materials that don't often find their, their way into a domestic context. Um, so the lines, the, li the lithic, the liminal, and the lines that bind, okay, I'm going to have it, give it a go. You ready? So, quirks, which we talked about today, are the tiniest little building block, blocks that we know, they're the ones that make the protons and the neutrons. So it's only when quirks and neutron, it's only when quirks come together that they can make the next level of relationships. So they make the protons and the neutrons, and it's only in relationship that the protons and the neutrons and the electrons can come together to make molecules. And it's only in relationship that the molecules can join together to make atoms. So, and it's only in relationship that the atoms can come together to make matter. So what at the very core of everything that makes us is actually this relation, relationality. It's not the actual matter that is necessarily important, it is the relationships between the matter. And so um, the mythic entity I'm using to describe that as snails, their silver trails are the silver threads that hold and relate and pull everything together that the weaver uses. Um, but, you know, I'm really, Science gives us all these 
opportunities to reframe the way that we see the world and actually we don't have to suspend belief. Going through a scientific lens gives us the opportunity to believe what we're actually thinking. So we don't have to make any kind of leaps into another cultural kind of framework. It is within our culture, it is within our kind of, you know, revered um, discipline that is, you know, science and obviously there's some fuzzy edges around that um, and politics that go with that as always. Um, but yeah, it's exciting to actually research it, put it into objects and believe it and build it into your worldview. So this is where I'm at at the moment. We're almost at the end. Trying, so I've spoken a lot to the associates um, or in the workshop this year about the fact that we occupy multiple contexts at any one time and we our built environment, all our objects reinforce one particular context. It's human orientated, it's um, Europatriarchal, it's very um, contained, but that we are also a part of responsible to in relation with many, many other contexts at any one time. So this is my attempt to try to start, this is very much a draft, but it's my attempt to try to put into um, a diagram and language um, this idea of how, um, how to think and recognise contexts outside of the immediate. So this is kind of how I see my creative practice, we have all these concentric contexts and lots of different modes of practice that are all kind of in a very messy way, but hopefully, I'm hoping by the time I'm 70, I'll have it worked out. <laughs> It'll be really easy to digest. Um, until then, I'll just keep, yeah, keep trying, exploring, experimenting. So speaking of context, um, this is the other aspect of, you know, living in Central Australia that um, allows me to really break out of the confines of um, modern neoliberalism, this strange, weird, uncanny time that we live in. James, my partner, three kids, a scholar, Zadie. Uh, so this will be our third year. We've been two years. We've, we made, designed and made the wagon. It's a beautiful, beautiful little object, huge object actually. Um, and we go for a month every year for a, a long walk. Um, we have a little e-perk, so we can send a message, one, a pre-recorded message once a night that says we're okay. Other than that, there's no, there's no modernize, there's no modernization, and it is just such a joy. It's also really hard work. Um, it's very physical. Um, you're with your children all the time, which is both beautiful and tiring. Um, but really, it does. It does give me the opportunity to live outside of context and, you know, build those powers of observation and think, daydream, have time to observe what it means to be alive on this hard to believe, magnificent, magical, crazy planet for the tiny little time that I'm conscious of it. Yeah. Thank you.